Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for attending the multimodality conference, uh, continuation of the multimodality uh, imaging conference. And today I will be talking with you guys about the use of uh, CMR for assessing the right ventricle and uh, right sided heart, um, heart valves. And give me a second while I start sharing my screen. Okay. So today, like I said, I'm talk I'm we'll be dis discussing um, uh, the the use of CMR for um, the use of CMR for assessing the right ventricle and and right sided heart valves. And this is kind of a segueing off of uh, the great talk uh, Dr. Sharif Naga uh, gave gave uh, um, last week. And um, the thing about the right ventricle is that uh, uh, first off, uh, there, here's my disclosures. No, nothing to disclose. Uh, so the thing we need to first answer, though, is uh, uh, I know Dr. Nago co covered things in great detail, but uh, what exactly does the right ventricle do? And uh, I know um, most of us are familiar with its uh, function and anatomy, but this is just a brief overview for the uh, non-cardiologist, non uh, non-physician uh, um, members, members of the audience. Um, just a bit of history, Dr. Uh, Sir William Harvey back in the day discussed the right ventricle for the sake of a uh, uh, for, for sake of uh, picking up blood from the body and transmitting for the lungs, but not for nourishing them. Um, but uh, the basic idea behind the right ventricle is it re receives blood from the systemic circulation, not be it through the IVC, through the SVC, or the coronary sinus, and sends it to pulmonary artery where uh, obviously um, gas exchange occurs. And then, and, then, um, and then the blood returns through the pulmonary veins back to left atrium, where the left ventricle then takes over and, and, and does things. Uh, uh, in the absence of any kind of uh, serious shunt, um, the rule of serial continuity takes place. And so uh, ideally in a, a, a patient without any shunt issues, uh, um, the RV and the LV stroke volume should be virtually identical uh, following the laws of continuity. In terms of an anatomy, um, uh, as you can see, uh, it's uh, uh, not as straightforward as uh, compared with the left ventricle. In fact, uh, um, it's a bit more complicated of a structure. On some views, if you uh, on short axis, you can see it looks uh, tr uh, triangular in appearance, especially on the short axis. Um, whereas, uh, I'm sorry, on the long axis. Uh, whereas on the short axis views, you get more of a crescentic, uh, crescentic appearance. So it's not the most straightforward uh, geometry that uh, that we're used to when we look at the uh, look at uh, um, cardiac anatomy. Uh, but roughly speaking, when we talk about the right ventricle, we tend to dis uh, describe it in terms of three different separate structures. There is the inlet um, involving the tricuspid, the uh, apical region, and then the more outlet regions. And there are actually three different se uh, separator bands that uh, go, uh, moderator bands that go along with this. So septomarginal, a uh, uh, kind of parietal layer out near the infundibulum, and then there's a, and, and then there's a, um, um, uh, more, more um, a, a, a separate uh, moderator band uh, section uh, as well. In terms of its uh, um, uh, muscular arrangement, it's actually a bit, a bit more complex than the uh, left ventricle, uh, whereas the left ventricle kind of rotates in an, uh, in an, uh, um, so that it's anisotropic throughout the layers. Um, it, uh, the right ventricle actually is mostly circular in the mid layer, uh, more oblique on the outer layer, and more longitudinal in the inner layer. So um, it does rotate but, um, as well, similar to left ventricle, uh, as you go from uh, endocardium to epicardial layer. But, the, but the, the more dominant forces tend to be more, more horizontal, circular, if you will, uh, in, in appearance. It is contiguous with the left, uh, with the left ventricle and the septum, the free wall. Um, but uh, um, if you look at enough of this anatomy, um, especially when we do our measurements, you'll notice that there, there's actually a bit of um, RV, LV separation in, in terms of the septal layer. So that, those are things to keep in mind. It's just us rehashing the, uh, what I just described before. Um, the fact that uh, you can roughly just uh, uh, separate it into an inlet, uh, trabecular septum, uh, apical uh, region, and then the infundibular region, uh, inflow, inflow and outflow, and uh, apical region as well. Okay. The issue, though, with the um, uh, right ventricle, like I said, is um, it's not it's not the most uh, clear cut geometric shape. So unlike the left ventricle, um, which gives kind of a uh, hemi ellipsoid appearance and, and has cl uh, clear circular parameters, it's uh, the right ventricle is, uh, uh, is a bit more challenging to try to quantify uh, more more um, more uh, objectively. Okay. Um, the right ventricle is also described as kind of the um, uh, second ventricle, the orphan ventricle, so to speak. So uh, um, in this day and age, more and more people are playing, paying more attention to it. But uh, now, nowadays, um, nowadays uh, 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 thankfully, it's getting the attention it deserves. But back in the day, it was uh, 
fairly well neglected. Um, these are uh, shown here as a, a table uh, indicating the difference between the RV and LV based on different parameters. And as you can see, um, there's um, like a, not only the shape, but the myocardial mass is less, the thickness is much less. In fact, uh, anything more than five millimeters uh, in, in terms of wall thickness is considered, considered uh, uh, um, hypertrophied, unlike the LV, which has to go above one centimeter uh, in thickness or more. Um, it has a much lower um, vascular resistance and lower pressures. And uh, um, uh, it, it uh, uh, but unlike the LV, it has greater resistance to uh, uh, to ischemia. So, so if uh, if there is a, a lack of oxygen supply, it's a little more uh, resilient. Okay. Um, sometimes when we're in the congenital world, and this is uh, um, an area that uh, my that our colleagues, uh, Dr. Duarte and Dr. Lin, are are very much uh, in tune with. Um, Trying to distinguish the right ventricle from the left ventricle is very important, and this actually comes up in a lot of Im cardiac imaging boards, especially echo boards and uh, congenital um, congenital um, uh, heart board exams as well. Um, but things to notice about the RV is that the um, atrial ventricular valve, the tricuspid valve, tends to be more apically displaced, so much so that uh, uh, if it exceeds the eight millimeters per meter squared uh, displacement versus the anterior uh, septal insertion of the mitral leaflet, then that's considered uh, um, potentially diagnostics of, of uh, Epstein's. Uh, like I, uh, I mentioned before, there's a moderator band, and yes, there's uh, there's moder uh, a moderator band in the RV. There's no moderator band in the LV. Um, the RV uh, also has a, a, a three a, a lot more papillary muscles, and it's not consistent from patient to patient. And uh, for that reason, um, for that reason, uh, for reproducibility purposes, we tend not to um, try to relegate the papillary muscles to to um, to outside the R RV cavity. Um, uh, it, it becomes a lot more complicated to reproduce. Um, I mentioned a tri foot um, tricuspid valve, appropriately named, and coarse regulations, of course. Okay. And unlike the LV, which uh, um, has a clear cut, uh, in the absence of bundle branch block, a clear cut uh, con contraction where everything comes together in a uniform fashion with an electrical signal, RV mechanics is a bit more complicated. It actually has more of a peristaltic motion where, where the um, inlet and, and apex contracts first, then, the, then followed by the out outlet, to, uh, uh, the outlet in fundibulum about 25 to 50 milliseconds later. This becomes more exaggerated when the, there's a conduction delay um, um, so, so uh, again, this, this shows that the RV is less more of a pressure media phenomenon. It's more of a kind of uh, mass flow related phenomenon uh, in terms of its uh, uh, function. So much so that, uh, uh, so much so that uh, you, actu you actually have some phenomena that show up in the cath tracings of the RV and PA that don't show up with the LV and, and A or and LV and a aorta. There's actually um, um, a hangout period where the where the um, RV pressure drops, that the PA pressure is still elevated, but the valve, the pulmonic valve, hasn't closed. So you actually have this hangout phenomenon that can actually persist uh, persist a bit um, before uh, before the the pulmonic valve actually closes. Again, emphasizing the fact that this is more a mass uh, flow uh, a flow mass uh, related uh, uh, principle guiding guiding the circulation in the right ventricle as opposed to the left ventricle. Um, uh, but that, but um, uh, that that's uh, that's the principle that I, I want to emphasize about the right ventricle in terms of hemodynamics. Um, calculating the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance is pretty straightforward. It's uh, just simply taking a pressure over over cardiac output. In this case, you would do the the uh, mean pulmonary pressures and the uh, uh, unlike the pulmonary capillary wedge, you would use the the RA pressure um, for as as a difference. And uh, the last thing I want to point out about the right ventricle is that if there's any physiology, uh, pathophysiology involved uh, where the pulmonary pressures go up, the right ventricle, like I said, is more flow mediated. It is less forgiving if the pulmonary pressures go up. Shown here is the stroke volume that the um, two different ventric uh, ventricles can put out. Left ventricle, as you can see, as we raise the um, um, the uh, systolic blood pressure that the left ventricle has to has to uh, push against uh, and, and and put out against in the systemic vascular resistance. The right ventricle, um, when you increase it just only um, uh, um, a few millimeters of mercury, there's a drastic drop in in, uh, in, in stroke volume as well. So again, the RV uh, RV is much less for, forgiving in terms of uh, higher pulmonary pressures. So whenever pulmonary hypertension develops in these patients, uh, it becomes a big deal because that can impact um, um, the overall uh, circuit flow. Okay. So then the question becomes, uh, why do cardiac CMR? Um, because uh, 
because uh, if you have a, a, a different imaging modality, um, if you're gonna pick a different imaging modality to image a patient as opposed to echo uh, uh, or, or CT or any other modality, uh, there must be a reason why, why that imaging modality um, uh, is used, uh, why there's certain advantages with that modality um, over others. Back in the, uh, I, back at just only a decade ago, um, uh, the original guidelines for for uh, assessing the right heart actually argued against using um, uh, using echo for RVF. That has changed now that uh, um, 3D techniques are evolving with e echo, and I haven't seen any new updates on this. But uh, um, now uh, um, uh, 3D echo has been considered comparable to 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 uh, CMR and CT techniques for assessing the right ventricle. Although uh, that's an area of, uh, that's continued to evolve. And, uh, and if a center is going to do it, they have to be experienced um, with it. But when it, when it comes to CMR, CMR actually does have some advantages. It has a very large field of, field of view. So you got, get to see not only, uh, of course, the heart, which is what we're honored, interested in, but you also get um, the other structures, uh, surrounding structures of, of interest. So, so uh, um, you get um, additional information, extracardic findings uh, for free. Uh, you can accept whatever imaging plane you want on the patient, um, so you're not limited to just some, to to uh, whatever acoustic windows you can you can uh, achieve, and uh, uh, you can actually get a, a, a pretty decent uh, image res resolution, and not just a spatial resolution, but also temporal resolution in, in most patients. Um, uh, there's also the advantage with CMR that you can actually do further tissue characterization, and I'll cover that uh, towards the end. And then, um, and then, uh, of course, the um, big thing about CMR is that it's a uh, ability to do volumes um, across a, um, a high temporal resolution um, uh, compared to other modalities, um, uh, but accurate spatial uh, volumes um, along with a um, decent uh, temporal um, resolution as well. So I did mention that it's. Um, I mentioned that's highly accurate, and this has been proven in using cat, uh, cadaveric and uh, uh, real life studies. So, um, so there have been uh, multiple studies where, where uh, uh, not only in cadaveric hearts, but also in in patients who undergo go, um, undergo uh, hemodynamic studies in the cath lab. It has been shown that the that the uh, um, that the uh, tomographic technique, the um, uh, the Simpson's uh, 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 using Simpson's rule of, of stacks of of discs, that we can get uh, very accurate volumes, and uh, so much so that there's very low variability for uh, so that you have low intra observer um, um, uh, variation, low intra observer variation, and uh, very lower low intra study uh, variation in in, uh, in patients if, when you bring them back. This becomes important because when you do want to serially assess these patients or have different people um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, do, uh, read the same, uh, read the uh, read the study on different patients, um, if you have too much variation, that introduces a lot of noise into assessment of the right ventricle um, and, and chamber quantification, and, and uh, that's something we want to uh, reduce um, uh, overall in, in the imaging world. When it comes, uh, and then this is just showing the evolution of through the um, um, different time periods. Um, the shown here is uh, um, um, literature, uh, a table from, from an article in, in CIRC, CIRC uh, cardiovascular imaging, showing that over time, the reproducibility of the RV and LV um, did, did uh, continue to improve um, uh, over time. And this was true of the LV and RV, but this is uh, what established the fact that, uh, that uh, um, uh, ventricular um, volume measurements were, were, re were reproducible. Now, what about uh, what's considered normal versus what's not? And uh, uh, there's uh, uh, in in the world of CMR, uh, we use a lot of uh, data from from Keems College. Um, Dr. Masera and her group uh, uh, recruited a patient, uh, a set of about 100 uh, volunteers, and uh, uh, bend them into different deciles of age, and and came up with these uh, diff uh, different uh, figures for uh, endoscopic volume and systolic volume, stroke volume, EF, and mass. And, uh, um, and this is shown here, showing difference between speed, uh, showing um, the overall characteristic of the cohort division by males versus females, um, and then also a uh, breakdown by, by decile of age. And uh, true to form, uh, just like the LV, the RV, uh, as, as we get older, tends to get smaller in size, and the, and the EF also tends to get, uh, um, get uh, larger uh, as a result of the shrinking denominator as well. But uh, this is the, um, the the reference that we use. There's been some advances in that, but um, this uh, all the data still boil down to boil down to uh, um, uh, uh, 
uh, accommodating the age and uh, the age and uh, uh, the age and gender uh, of these patients uh, when it comes to uh, determining whether or not they have a, a dilated ventricle or decreased systolic volume, decreased TF, etc. Okay. So. Now that I, uh, I answered uh, what the RV does and uh, um, uh, what the RV does um, and why cardiac MRI, how do we do it? So we start off with uh, uh, conventional anatomic views. Uh, so shown here is a nice axial view and we do an oblique sagittal plane um, centered on the left ventricle. This gives us a pseudo two chamber. From that uh, 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 pseudo, uh, pseudo two chamber and pseudo uh, uh, and then from, from that, uh, we uh, make adjustments um, of an oblique uh, axial plane, and this gives us um, a pseudo four chamber. From that, then we um, center everything on the left ventricle um, with a stack of cines, and then we get these beautiful uh, uh, beautiful stacks going through the base to the apex of the heart uh, that, that then allows us to do our quantifications. For additional views, uh, all, of the, all of us have, may have seen this in, in uh, Dr. Feingobahn's uh, echo text before, uh, but this is showing a real life, ex uh, a real Cine example, where we then do additional cuts to try to get the um, other, other uh, uh, chamber views. And I, I do bring this up also because um, just not long ago, we had professor rounds and uh, I remember a fellow being asked to assess a four chamber view of the heart and he commented the RV looks a little bit generous. Um, uh, the problem with this is that you can see we alter our plane to optimize uh, optimize getting the largest RV. So uh, be careful when, when you assess the chamber sizes because you want to know how your technique was done and what scan planes uh, were chosen. Um, case in point, uh, uh, case in point, I'll bring it up a little later, uh, but uh, an echo. Uh, there's, uh, when, if you look at your echo protocol, there is such thing as an RV focus view, which is different from a standard LV uh, four chamber view um, because uh, the RV in that case is focused, it, it, it is altered a bit more to give, a, a give cuts that are a little bit similar to what I'm showing here. But uh, uh, I, I want to rule out the misconception that uh, just, because, just because the RV looks a little more generous, um, throw away that idea, know what you're actually scanning before, before you make that assumption. Um, know how, how your imaging setup, your imaging acquisition was set up uh, before making that kind of comment. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the RV, we actually are able to acquire a, a couple other, other views. We can actually uh, orient planes that are, uh, that uh, um, I was taught of kind of snowman view in the high basal short axis. And this actually gives us the RV three chamber view. Um, this is, uh, CMR is one of the few modalities that can, that can actually give you the inflow outflow view um, uh, very nicely. So you can see the tricuspid and, and pulmonic valves and the um, anterior and inferior um, 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 parts of the RV free wall um, pretty pretty nicely. We can actually get a separate, uh, um, a slightly oblique cut and end up with an RV two chamber view um, as well. Okay, and then uh, for added measure, we do do a, a, a perpendicular plane view through the through the RVOT to get the RVOT, uh, a separate RVOT view, um, um, just for good measure, okay? But uh, this is uh, from Dr. Rudsky's uh, um, paper um, um, and Jace uh, talking about echo uh, acquisition of RV. And you can see that depending on how you rotate the probe, you can actually shift how the RV looks. Uh, so so uh, uh, this is very true in the CMR world and, and, and true in the echo world. Uh, depending on what you're optimizing your views for, you can you can uh, make make the views look very very different. Okay. Now, uh, of course, we can also do visual assessments, and shown here is uh, shown here if this will play. Okay, the view uh, here is not not playing, but that's okay. Um, what this top view shows here is what an art normal RV would look like if um, when it when it's uh, contracting, and you'll see that there's. Um, uh, uh, contraction of the uh, lateral wall uh, it shrinks down. Um, and you also see the tricuspid descent. Um, uh, uh, so those are different things to pay attention to uh, visually. And you also see the lateral wall and the short axis uh, come in. The danger with commenting uh, on RV function of the, uh, of, on the short axis though, is that uh, because everything is translating, um, in, in translating through the plane as well, one can get confused and, and, get, and get fooled into thinking that parts of the wall are not moving. Uh, because uh, um, different parts of the RV actually coming into plane um, in, in the different views. If this played, um, this is not playing either, but uh, if this played, this would also this would show that the RV is not actually doing any of the stuff I said. The lateral wall 
um, would, would not be uh, contracting as vigorously. The tricuspid annulus would not be descending as well. Uh, you would see the lateral wall on the short axis uh, um, uh, not, not, not as vigorous of you. And then, uh, but, uh, but uh, one thing that can still be appreciated on CMR is the fact that you can see uh, whether or not the RV is severely dilated shown here. There's no doubt in this case that there's uh, very much apical dominance of the RV. Um, it's um, it's uh, short axis dimensions are much, uh, um, um, uh, much greater than the LV. In fact, the LV looks kind of smallish and compressed in its appearance, even um, have a septal flattening in this case. Um, uh, which is consistent with the RV, R, RV uh, overload picture in, uh, in this case as well. Shown here is a, a, a case of RV hypertrophy and also a, a case of both uh, uh, um, septal, uh, uh, septal systolic and diastolic uh, flattening. And this is all consistent with a patient with pulmonary hypertension uh, who has pressure and you can see that um, there's so much pressure in the right ventricle, it's actually squeezing against the left ventricle and systole, as well as a, um, a diastolic uh, volume overload um, in this case. Okay. And then uh, one other thing I want to point out. Okay. And this is not playing either, but that's okay. Um, when, when we give contrast to these patients, gallium and contrast, we actually do an, uh, an MR angiogram looking at the, uh, looking at the um, um, thoracic aorta. But when we do that, we actually, it actually has to pass through the uh, SVC into the RA. And if the RA, uh, RA has elevated pressures or there's significant tricuspid regurgitation, you'll actually get contrast reflux into the hepatic vein. So this is the equivalent of the Doppler hepatic venous reversal that's, that's seen in, in, um, in a spectral Doppler echo. So, uh, so we actually integrate this information as well when we're assessing uh, assessing the uh, the right side of the uh, right side of the of the heart for significant TR or or elevated RA pressures. Uh, so, something to keep in mind when when uh, you're looking at um, an angiogram. Okay. Now. Going on in, into how we then post-process the ventricle and, and quantify things. Uh, I, I mentioned before, we make no geometric assumptions and we use the, uh, um, the, the stack of disks um, uh, Simpson method. And uh, shown here, we make no geometric assumptions about the shape of the RV. We get tomographic slices through and we, uh, and we trace everything from, from base to apex and we can end up with an end acid volume. Repeat that insistently and then you have, and then you can uh, quantify your, your ejection fraction from that as well. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, every slice is uh, uh, is whatever thickness you set it to. And in this case, we usually do in increments of about uh, 10 millimeters, so about one centimeter um, uh, um, uh, gaps. Uh, I should say gaps, but one centimeter uh, between the different slices um, that we acquire of the of, of the ventricle. Okay. We actually have one other method that uh, for, for CMR quantification that we use, and that's the uh, phase contrast method. So you can think of it as kind of the equivalent of a pulse wave Doppler. Uh, although unlike uh, echo, where, where the beams aligned parallel to the flow, we uh, orient ourselves perpendicular flow. And what we can do is then acquire, um, uh, acquire a phase contrast images where the um, the intensity of the uh, pixel, be it black or white, depending on whatever direction you encode, uh, uh, then corresponds to velocity. We sum up all the velocities, kind of get a mean velocity for that area, and velocity times area gives you gives you flow. And uh, we can then get a flow curve and get a, um, a stroke volume through the um, through the uh, pulmonary artery through the through the pulmonic valve. Okay. Now a question has come up in in, in the past before. Well. Um, we do a short axis here. Some centers uh, get axial stacks and actually do an uh, axial RV. Is there actually a difference? And turns out, not really. Um, the RV and LV um, uh, provide very similar information, and it's been shown shown that uh, when you compare the two, um, they're they're pretty much on par. So, is there any advantage of doing one or the other? Well, uh, uh, it, the answer is actually yes. Depend. There is one particular pathology. Uh, that does lend itself better to the R, uh, to the axial um, axial um, method of uh, RV quantification over the uh, uh, short axis stack, uh, short axis uh, cardiac stack, and that's an Epstein's anomaly. The reason being is because you have atrialization of the right ventricle, usually a very long, long redundant uh, leaflet, um, uh, uh, um, redundant uh, um, uh, leaflet, and a very very short septal leaflet. Um, then the right ventricles, uh, right ventricle uh, is not as well appreciated on the short axis because 
uh, the, the tricuspid valve is not as well appreciated on the short axis, whereas it's better appreciated on the axial stacks. And so you can actually then adjust your, your, your um, uh, concentrations to get the, the true morphologic RV in the Epstein's case um, uh, to accommodate that. So, so we do try to remind the CMR techs uh, whenever we have an Epstein case show up to then try to get axial synase um, uh, covering the entire right ventricle so that then we can pr provide a more accurate uh, more accurate uh, um, uh, true RV quantification in that case. Otherwise, the two are roughly equivalent and some centers will do one over the other. Okay, and this is just showing um, uh, how um, axial, um, the axial um, uh, stacks that I showed uh, versus short axis stacks compare with uh, uh, phase contrast, uh, um, a phase contrast imaging of the R, um, PA RV stroke, um, uh, PA uh, stroke volume, okay. Um, uh, and uh, um, this, is, this is just harking to, back to, in fact, uh, when it comes to the right ventricle, um, one of our favorite customers is the congenital heart folks. Um, uh, and uh, congenital heart disease, since it, uh, many of the things that affect, uh, uh, affect, get affected in the congenital heart disease uh, affect the right ventricle. Um, uh, it's actually uh, recommended not only for Epstein's, but many different congenital heart diseases for assessing the RV and RV function. So does it clinically matter um, and that's always a good question. Um, um, Dr. Kenyon's is a so what kind of question. And uh, for that, um, I hope to take you, uh, take you through some different case, uh, show you some prognostic information, uh, basic prognostic information and take you through some different cases uh, showing some use case scenarios. So, our, so RV function does matter. In fact, so much so that uh, I, um, I know Dr. Naga last week talked about how it's important in terms of uh, uh, patients uh, uh, patients' uh, uh, cardiac function and also their prognosis. Shown here is the data from uh, Dr. Uh, Vocal uh, uh, and others um, back in circulate uh, back in a publication in circulation back in 2006, and he showed that uh, um, he showed that uh, it, uh, if you're uh, whether or not you have normal or high PA preserved or RV uh, preserved RVF or low RVF, um, in all, all those cases, their survival was overall roughly pretty similar on the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, uh, groups one through three. But the moment your RVEF goes for patients with pulmonary hypertension, the uh, prognosis um, uh, becomes much more grim. You can see there's a, a more rapid uh, drop off in survival uh, over time. So yes, uh, RV function, RVEF uh, does matter. And so, uh, uh, and so uh, uh, know, knowing what the RV function is uh, in, in patients with pulmon high pulmonary pressures for whatever reasons, be it's left side heart failure, uh, uh, um, uh, primary, uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, et cetera, um, then, uh, then the uh, RV function becomes very important prognostically. So let's, let's move into the different cases. And uh, uh, since I'm on Zoom, I hope I have some fellows around because uh, uh, I'm gonna be picking on you guys. Um, but um, for the fellows, uh, we have a, a patient here admitted for um, chest pain and um, shown here is a four chamber view as well as a short axis view and an LGE uh, image. Um, can anyone unmute and comment on what, what they see? So there is uh, it, on the LGE on the far right, basically there's a transmural infarct looks like in the inferior wall that I can see. Also, when you look at the wall motions, the inferior, uh, the mid inferior, because we see the pelt muscle, the mid inferior does not move as well as the other walls. Looks at least severely hypokinetic from this picture. I mean, I need another picture. Yes, yes. And, and how about the LGE? I'm sorry, and then the LGE, the RV has actually, uh, LGE, I just uh, looking at it again, the RV has LGE all the way as well. Um, so the inferior um, and then the lateral wall also, the bottom uh, lateral, I should say, on the image. And then the RV looks bigger than the LV, at least on the fourth chamber with um, some decreased function. The LV looks, the function looks okay. Thicken micro valve, at least. And then tricuspid, there's the R for sure, and the RA is big. So uh, George, what, uh, what do you think happened to this patient? I mean, it looks like, um, at least uh, given the involvement of the mid-inferior and then the, uh, the RV, I mean, it looks like an infarct basically on the um, uh, RCA. Um, yes, yes. 
So you you were astute. You pointed out that there's um, a uh, a kinesis of the inferior inferior RV wall. There's LGE in the same region. There's also in, inferior inferior septal uh, uh, infarct in the LV. And so this patient came in with a, an RCA infarct and RCA STEMI. And uh, when he had the CMR done, um, this highlighted nicely that uh, his RV had gone down uh, because of an um, associated RV infarct. But uh, great, great job. Um, and this is just showing more of the same. Did, uh, Eric, did George also comment on the papillary muscles? Uh, no, he did not. But yes, you are correct, Dr. Shaw. There, there's actually, uh, there, there's actually, um, um, uh, you can actually see the papillaries, the, the posterior medial papillaries on the cine, but then they kind of disappear on the LG. Um, so that, um, uh, let's do that as always, Dr. Shaw, uh, that's indicative of papillary uh, scarring, papillary involvement. So papillary infarct for sure. Okay. Uh, but these are different images just showing roughly the same. Uh, and more different views showing more of the RV in, in the three chamber and the two chamber view. And you can see again that the inferior wall is completely out, whereas the anterior RV is, is preserved. So this is a case where the patient didn't get so lucky. Remember, uh, I said much earlier that RV is usually spared um, in terms of ischemia. In this case, uh, uh, this patient was not um, with the infarct. And so the RV had, um, had gone out. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, so when RV infarct does occur, it's a pretty serious uh, is uh, issue because uh, we've all got taught in medical school that uh, um, this presents with a, tr uh, a triad, um, hypotension, elevated jugular veins, clear lung fields. Um, so so uh, this, th uh, these are patients that uh, uh, you want to be very, very careful of, of uh, getting, uh, getting beta blockers and nitroglycerin because you may catastrophically have lower their blood pressure uh, in fact, cause them to, to go into shock. Um, in fact, these patients are a little more volume dependent. Um, we've learned nowadays not to go overboard, overboard with uh, uh, volume resuscitating patients, but uh, you still want to keep them a little on the wetter side so that they, because so, they're uh, definitely a lot more preload dependent uh, with their RV out of, out of the, um, out of um, non-functional out of the picture, unfortunately. It does have, um, a problem, um, it, it does uh, it does become hemodynamic significant in about ten percent of patients, but it's actually a more prevalent prevalent uh, prevalent than we like. Um, the uh, CMR world has kind of uh, elucidated that. So so uh, when patients come in with uh, uh, RCA disease, RCA infarcts, uh, I make it a point to look out for for um, concurrent RV infarct because that's also that's also important. It's actually so important that uh, um, uh, so important that. Uh, Let's see, it's so important that uh, it impacts survival. And this article back in 2001, where RVMI was uh, demonstrated, um, uh, ha um, shows that uh, it had a strong con contributor to mortality in, in these patients. You can see all the different beta coefficients in this uh, model predicting survival in, in, in the patients. RVMI by far um, was very uh, was a very large component um, uh, of survival um, in these. Uh, uh, in, in these patients. Okay. And then this is just a, a meta, meta analysis bringing home the point that when um, no RV infarct is, is present versus absent, that uh, um, uh, mortality goes up, cardiogenic shock goes up, uh, arrhythmias and, and conduction blocks go up. So again, very important to, to note when you're, when you're doing CMR and you pick this up. Okay. Moving on. Um, this is a, 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 a patient uh, who uh, has a history of PVCs. Uh, actually, some of you may know her. She, 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 uh, she works with us, uh, but uh, she, she uh, 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 had PVCs um, uh, a lot. Um, some explain dizziness every now and then. And uh, one, of my, one of our former uh, CMR fellows finally got, got to uh, uh, capture images on her when her heart was, was, uh, was cooperative. Um, uh, and uh, um, for the fellows, um, CMR fellows, uh, Amr, are you on? Yes. So uh, what do you see? So here the uh, RV looks dilated. Uh, yes. The LV, and also uh, we could appreciate uh, a wall motion abnormality like at the base compared to the apex. Um, so when when seeing that, it comes to mind the uh, ARVC. Yes. 
So you're ab absolutely right. The, the RV is a bit dilated. The RVEF, it actually looks not so hot. Um, in fact, uh, you, if you look at the lateral tricuspid annulus, it's not um, as vigor vigorous an excursion. Um, uh, hopefully, um, um, the people in the echo side are, are, uh, uh, are, are far more cognizant of looking at TAPSI and, and using that to kind of gauge RV function. But the visual, visual TAPSI, TAPSI, so to speak, in this case, is not so hot. And then, uh, um, Amr, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of the anterior RV? Um, okay. So the, the anterior RV is uh, looks looks also like does does have a hypo hypokinesia actually. What about uh, this? Do you see my mouse? Uh, is that a, a, a dyskinetic uh, portion, segment of the RV? Exactly, yes, dyskinesia. Yeah. Remember we had a discussion the other day about, uh, about hypokinesis, akinesis, and dyskinesia? Right. You clearly see when the RV is contracted in systole, this portion actually gets bigger compared to diastole. Correct. So this is true RV dyskinesia. Perfect, thanks. I think it's more, it's actually aneurysm. Because if you look in diastole, there's a displacement of the shape. There's an outpouching in diastole as well, right? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, the, the, but uh, this this has all the hallmark hallmarks, as Amr pointed out, of uh, ARVC, arrhythmogenic ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, so much so that the um, this patient went went on to to uh, get a uh, get a defibrillator and and get the rest of the family screened. Okay, but. Uh, um, uh, but uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria for for, um, for ARVC, remember it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not simply an imaging diagnosis. Uh, CMR just happens to be one component of it. And shown here is the 2010 task uh, uh, task force criteria for for um, for um, uh, classifying uh, uh, cl classifying a, a major or minor criteria by CMR. So for uh, just to reiterate for for CMR. Uh, you need the first of all. You need regional wall motion abnormalities, either akinesia, dyskinesia of the uh, of the RV somewhere, or dyskinesia. That's a must. You can see that both for major minor. That's the first bullet point, and one of the following: either the RV EDV is dilated, um, uh, different cri criteria for male or female, greater than 100, uh, 100 for female, greater than one one ten for indexed um, indexed RV EDV, or an injection fraction less than forty percent. Um, uh, minor criteria are less le uh, less uh, um, uh, strict, um, uh, and uh, the next step down, if, if you will. But keep in mind, this is only one criteria. You have to look at other criteria like a clinical history, ECG findings. Um, if if a biopsy is done, um, fibro fibro fatty infiltrate is considered one of them. Uh, used to be a criteria for CMR, the fibro, fibro fatty criteria, but uh, it's been found that we overcall that a lot, and you can actually get this in patients with uh, uh, with uh, lipomatosis, with uh, excessive uh, fat in the mediastine and, 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 and obese individuals. Uh, so um, the MRI um, MRI criteria have completely removed that, and we no longer call fibro fatty infiltrate. Um, um, uh, although if we do see it, we'll comment on it, but it's not considered one of the one of the uh, necessary criteria for diagnosing ARVC by MRI. Um, it's it's not um, so e even though we do have this criteria, it's while while it's a fairly fairly uh, specific, it's not sensitive. Obviously, uh, patients will have any number of different uh, uh, different pathologies. Um, RV infarct, pulmonary hypertension, uh, who knows what else um, uh, that can cause these changes. So just because we have some of these criteria, especially just the simple volume and, and function, um, that itself is not is, is not sensitive um, sensitive for, for A or B C. So please keep that in mind. Um, shown here are the sensitivity and specificities for for, for uh, um, picking up ARVC and, and confirmed ARVC patients. Now moving on, uh, this is another common indication for sending patients to CMR. Uh, uh, so this is a 30-year-old uh, uh, former fellow of, of ours who decided to uh, volu uh, volunteer for research. And uh, um, uh, any any of the fellows want to comment on on what they see, what they think? And functions, both functions are okay. Uh, 
uh, left and right of the uh, RB. Um, both valves are a little bit thickened. It looks like the chambers are dilated. It's hard to say, I mean, without really measuring, but it looks like at least the RA and the LA are dilated. Maybe also I would say the LV and the RV. I mean, to be honest, it looks like an athlete's heart, just if I had to pick one thing now. And then pulmonic is okay, tricuspid is okay, the RV is fine, no criteria for ARVD like we just discussed. And I think from pulmonary veins, at least we see two. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so this particular volunteer uh, uh, um, was like you, George. He works out a lot, uh, actually does a lot of running uh, cardio. And uh, absolutely, the, uh, his heart rates were in the 50s. Um, his, um, the chambers did come out uh, um, dilated, um, uh, but um, every, everything, came, uh, everything came out uh, normal function, no issues whatsoever. But uh, this comes up again, uh, again and again as to whether or not we're dealing with a, uh, um, uh, someone with a, a pathologic enlargement of, of the different uh, chamber sizes, um, right, right ventricle and RA included. And so uh, um, these these patients uh, show up show up in, in our CMR lab, and then we do go through all this, look at their clinical history, and, and have to comment on whether or not we're deciding if we're dealing with an athlete's heart or not. And uh, you're you're absolutely right. Um, uh, shown here uh, um, is some data uh, by uh, Lagersh et cetera, um, uh, who at all who uh, who did a comparison between non-athlete and, and endurance athletes' hearts, and sure enough, um, actually found that the uh, that there was an increased RV to LV ratio, um, uh, um, uh, uh, RV to LV ratio, uh, and 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 and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and these patients um, for the EDV, not so much a difference. And systolic volume, there was uh, was a difference. Uh, so so much so that uh, so much so that the uh, RV LV ratio was was more uh, was more elevated than the, the systolic. Um, but the EF, uh, EF uh, was actually um, uh, kind of reversed um, ratio-wise, uh, but the but the mass was um, was uh, was relatively the same. This is comparing athletes versus non-athletes. But the RV actually is one of the first things to start remodeling and changing in in, uh, in, in athletes. And this does get into the discussion of uh, not not every athlete's the same. Some do more resistance exercises or or weightlifting, etc. Which is a bit more di a, a bit different from uh, those who do more aerobic exercises like marathon running, etc. The way the heart adapts is, is very different between the two different different uh, uh, with, between the different types of exercises that are done depending on its effects on the heart. But the RV for sure is one of the uh, things that for, uh, first begin to change, begin enlarging, and and, and having all, all these differences as well. Okay. Um, in fact. Uh, um, in fact, Mesa actually went through and, and looked at the uh, different parameters uh, based on uh, quint quintiles of exercise activity. And again, confirmed that uh, the more athletic you are, the higher quintile of exercise you are, um, even, uh, even adjusted for uh, other different things, um, the larger EDV, um, the larger your stroke volume, um, the, the, um, uh, but no difference in the ejection fraction overall. But uh, yes. Well-developed athletes do have larger uh, right ventricles, and uh, is, is the bottom line. Okay. Um, often the two get confused, though. Um, a lot of times we get patients who come come in with unexplained dizziness and passing out, and so the question becomes uh, ARVC or athlete's heart. And so, uh, 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 looking at the different criteria, uh, you'll see that athletes tend to have much larger ventricles. But they, their EF is very is a, a fairly decently well preserved. Otherwise, um, their their mass. Uh, uh, let's see, yeah, their 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 um, overall um, mass tends to be uh, tend, tends to be LV mass tends to be preserved. They didn't quantify uh, RV mass in here. Forgive me, uh, but they uh, tended to. Um, not have as dilated ventricles compared uh, uh, in, in terms of ratio versus the ARVC patients. And uh, uh, ARVC patients tended to have more wall motion abnormalities, LGE, et cetera. And hence why I bring up the fact, uh, again, that uh, before you call anything else about, uh, about uh, uh, morphologic size and function, look at the actual wall motion abnormality in these patients before, before you comment on ARVC. What about fibrosis? And this one gets a little bit more uh, complicated because um, uh, when, when they looked for 
athletes with myocardial fibrosis. Um, they actually did find there's some there there's a there, there's some uh, prevalence uh, of uh, myocardial fibrosis in, in uh, some athletes. And what that means exactly, we're not exactly sure. And this goes along line, the line, lines of uh, patients who undergo marath- who undergo training for marathons and and uh, triathlons and and uh, or or Ironman and or uh, extremely uh, a very extreme sports, if you will, uh, extreme extreme aerobic conditioning, extreme exercises. They're going to put themselves through the ringer trying to do these kind of uh, exercises. And when they're when they're done, uh, so, um, uh, some of them have volunteered, had their blood samples taken, and they there's been a detection of uh, elevated troponins. So a definite myocardial injury um, 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 uh, by blood markers. And uh, myocardial fibrosis has been detected in these patients as well, these, these, uh, well uh, these extreme athletes. So there is this thought pattern of maybe there's such thing as too much exercise, or maybe there's pathologic. Uh, th- there may be a, a difference in some uh, um, athletes where they'd actually diverge, d- uh, diverge in terms of um, in terms of uh, um, their cardiac remodeling, some go into the more pathologic category. So it's, that's an active area of, uh, of uh, debate and research, uh, um, but uh, something, something to look into down the road. Okay. Uh, but let's move on. Um, shown here is a 67 year old female with liver cancer. I'm not gonna say what kind, but this is a nice oldie and goodie. And uh, uh, do we have any general fellows on the line? No general cardiology fellows? I'm here, Dr. Yang. I don't know if you can hear me, George Waits. Hey, George. Um, so what do you see? Um, th- this is a nice oldie and gold, uh, oldie but goldie uh, uh, kind of case that shows up in the echo lab um, uh, every now and then. Yeah, so I can see that the, uh, the right side of the heart has enlarged chamber size. It's definitely marked enlargement of the right atrium. Um, and uh, I would say the RV also looks uh, larger than the LV cavity. Um, I would add, it looks like uh, in terms of function, uh, I think the wall motion looks fairly normal, uh, both right and left uh, contracting uh, appears normally. Uh, I don't see any. I get get the feeling George is trying to be thorough, but he's beating around the bush. There's there's a clear abnormality here. What do you what do you think of the valves? Oh, oh obviously. Okay, so there's a there's a apical displacement of of the uh, tricuspid annulus, I I think. Uh, but oh oh gosh, and uh, now okay, the clear abnormality is uh, the, the there's this rip roaring TR here. I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. And if you uh, look uh, look at the RV three chamber view, what do you think of the pulmonic valve? Okay, so in the three chamber view, um, it looks, let's see, yeah, so it looks like there is also uh, some uh, steno- stenosis. Yes. As well. So this is starting to look, um, let's see. So what's we have the pulmonic stenosis. What's so the what kind of these the tricuspid regurgs? Uh, he, yes, George. George just commented. He said it's, it's rip roaring. Yes, yeah, but the mechanism of it. Yes. Are you there, George? Yes, I'm here. Um, and on the question of the uh, mechanism of the TR, I, I mean, I think there's some annular dilation um, for one thing, but uh, um, in, in you know, with the R, uh, enlarged RV, I think that that'd be one. Uh, uh, that's the etiology I would suspect. Okay. Um, uh, so if you look at the mitral valve, the leaflets are moving. What's the tricuspid leaflets doing? Hello? Um, for the sake of moving on, I'll just point out. Um, Question one, sorry. There you go. You actually, yeah. I was going to ask you what cancer you yeah. thought you had. Um, yeah, fixed. Yes. So Sorry, my audio has been in and out. Because of the uh, um, because of the uh, HIAA, um, the serotonin effects um, um, the, uh, from the carcinoid, 
uh, the, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonic valves have remodeled and they're all tethered and fixed. They're no longer uh, moving. And so this is rip roaring TR, as you pointed out, that's caused uh, RV, uh, RV uh, and RA remodeling. Uh, so much so that it's now impinging on the left side. Uh, but this, this is a, a severe TR in the case of a, in the case of a carcinoid patient. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you, George. Um, now, when it comes to valvular regurgitation, uh, we do uh, we actually do the method of quantifying the RV, RV, EDV, EESV, get the stroke volume, and we actually get the PA systolic flow, and we get the TI regurgitation volume from that. So, very similar, uh, very um, identical way do we do it to uh, MR. And the reason why we choose to do it this way, as opposed to try to do any kind of direct method on the tricuspid valve, um, remember I said phase contrast, we had to set the plane perpendicular to the blood flow. The tricuspid valve. Is, is moving in and out. Um, it has a, um, some apical descent uh, when, when, when the RV is contracting. So you're never sure you're in the same, same uh, uh, area. And uh, so you're never, sure, uh, uh, you're never sure if you can uh, accommodate for the actual uh, mitral, mitral annular, annular level um, and, and be sure that you're, me you're measuring a true, the true tricuspid inflow. And that can affect the, um, the, the tricuspid foreflow and, and the reverse flow as well. So try, trying to quantify it using direct methods is challenging with the atrioventricular valve. So that's why we do the method of taking the ventricular stroke volumes, assuming no other issues, and then taking the PA systolic uh, forward flow and, and subtracting the difference to get the uh, chair return volume. One group did try to do, uh, quote unquote, um, um, uh, al aliasing, uh, where they tried to estimate the EROA using um, tricuspid valve, uh, using tricuspid valve, but um, for obvious reasons, we haven't heard too much about that. Uh, that's not considered as reliable and, and may be misleading. But more importantly, um, our own group, uh, 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 Yang Zan, when he was still a fellow here, did some uh, very important work where he uh, actually looked at uh, all comers, um, all patients who came to the CMR lab and, and, uh, and had, uh, um, had TR uh, estimates done. And so we, he, strat he, along with Dr. Shaw and, and, and all uh, uh, went through and, and uh, uh, did, uh, did um, uh, uh, did a uh, survival analysis and, and, and found that there are different cutoffs uh, that indicate uh, lower risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, depending on the presence of, uh, uh, de de depending on the degree of uh, tricuspid regression volume severity and tricuspid regression uh, fraction. This was just uh, published last year, but, uh, um, but uh, this was great work he did. Uh, this led to him uh, becoming a, a young investigator finalist in, in, in the ACC conference uh, um, uh, the year before, um, uh, but uh, this is this is important work that uh, um, uh, may may lead to some revisions of our uh, uh, of our regurgitation guidelines down the road. Okay. And this is just showing more more of the different data shown above are the Kaplan Meier survival curves, um, uh, showing mild, moderate, um, uh, severe using his classifications and associated uh, uh, survival um, um, mortality. And then shown here is the uh, 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 hazard ratio for mor mor mortality, the spline curves, uh, showing that, um, that as regression of volume increased, um, so did um, the adjusted hazard ratio mortality. Same with the tricuspid regression uh, um, fraction as well. Okay. Moving on, uh, we're going to shift gears and, and uh, move into uh, 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 Huey's and Valeria's world a little bit. Um, and just for time purposes, I, I'll, I'll uh, walk everyone through this. Shown here is an RV3 chamber view. Uh, you can see the RV, RA and RV are pretty generous, functions a little bit off. Um, and then you can see a lot of uh, flow through the um, pulmonic valve, not only in systole, but in diastole. And, uh, um, and the RVOT view, this demonstrates the same, that there's a lot of uh, backflow as well. And, and then um, shown here is not so clear cut, a, a cut of the RV. Uh, but you can see everything that looks a little bit more generous. And uh, please believe me when I say the ape, there's RV apical dominance, um, the RV is enlarged. So uh, most tetralogy patients back in the day when they underwent, uh, underwent uh, 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 VSD closure and, a pul and a fixing of the pulmonic stenosis, uh, a lot of times they um, had a 
pediatric cardiac surgeon tell tell uh, tell me and everyone this that they actually take their pinky and just shove it into the uh, RVOT and and rip up the um, pulmonic valve. And unfortunately, this 35 year old patient with histology of flow um, had the consequence. He has rip roaring uh, pulmonic regurgitation. Now, for this method, because the um, the pulmonic artery is pretty fixed and doesn't move around much, we can actually do direct um, uh, pulmonic regurgitation methods. Um, uh, with a little, little more confidence and, and just like we do with AI to estimate PR. Although I still insist on the uh, text doing IVC and SEC inflows uh, be because uh, sometimes the turbulence in the forward flow of the pulmonic artery makes it, makes it harder to quantify the forward flow um, accurately as well. Okay. So I won't belabor this, um, uh, but uh, um, other than to say yes, um, I, as I mentioned for the congenital um, Hard guidelines from ACCHA do recommend uh, serial CMR in, in uh, patients with RV, uh, with their RVs affected. Um, um, there has been a um, metagression analysis done to look look at the uh, um, uh, impact of um, of uh, um, uh, RV uh, uh, RV uh, dilatation and and, uh, and issues and their and its effect on a, a effect on a, uh, uh, survival, etc. Okay, but I won't belabor this. Um, belabor this, uh, but there there is actually a large cohort, the indicator cohort, for for uh, congenital patients that that they're studying these kind of things as well, and and, and they have shown that uh, the, um, that the um, that the um, again uh, uh, saying the same thing again over and over again, the fact that uh, uh, RV enlargement um, um, increase in RV enlargement increase in RV mass uh, does um, portend a, a grimmer. A, um, uh, a, a grimmer, a grimmer prognosis in these patients. Okay. And last but not least, uh, um, is a patient uh, with sleep apnea. Um, shown, shown here, you can see the RV is very generous. Uh, RA is also very generous compared to the left side structures. You can see the RV is not as hot. Um, and then I'm showing the pulmonary artery here, and this is a quick, dirty way of of uh, gauging the PA size. Uh, in this case, the PA is enlarged relative to, to the aorta. Um, if the aorta is enlarged, all bets are off. You should go in and, and actually measure it. But in this case, um, we, all, I, uh, often, we often see that uh, uh, see in radiology reports on CT that the PA is enlarged, suspect pulmonary hypertension. And in this case, they are correct. Um, but yes, uh, the PA does tend to, to uh, dilate up so much so that uh, so much so that uh, some people have come up with entire classification systems just just based on PA diameter. The most the most specific cutoff it, um, in the CT world is using a, a cutoff about three point four centimeters, uh, but um, normal is uh, normal is anything less than three. Anything above three, between three and four, um, they're different tiers. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, uh, thirty four millimeters and above is considered. Uh, uh, probably a little more specific for pulmonary hypertension. But keep in mind, just because you see enlarged PA, that does not automatically mean pulmonary hypertension. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is actually a, a pressure diagnosis, a mean pul pulmonary pressure diagnosis of, of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. Uh, uh, of mercury. Um, and, but that's the formal, formal uh, criteria by the World Symposium of, uh, on pul pulmonary hypertension that, that meets uh, every few years. Um, but uh, PA size can excuse me, PSAs can dilate up for any other uh, any other reason. You can have PA aneurysms, just like you have aortic aneurysms uh, from connective tissue diseases, et cetera. You can, you can have uh, uh, high flow slates like patients with uh, anemia, especially our cirrhotic patients, the PA will be enlarged along with everything else, uh, everything else in the body um, due to the high flow states. Um, you can have uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, mycotic infections from tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera, that can, that can lead to that. So um, just because the PA is enlarged, don't automatically jump to pulmonary hypertension. Um, and my tendency is I tend to call uh, enlarged PA and just leave it at that, let, let the clinician ordering uh, draw their own conclusions um, from that. Okay. Um, but can we do it um, in CMR? Uh, uh, there was some uh, work back in the day uh, where they try to look at the um, angle, um, the uh, angle um, be, um, between the LV and uh, LV, and, uh, um, um, LV uh, walls in the septum. Um, so, so they try to use septal angle. And I'll show that there's actually been some advances since then, but uh, obviously this is, hasn't taken off because uh, most centers don't use this for pulmonary pressure estimations. Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that. Um, RV insertion LGE does come up every now and then. I have been asked uh, whether or not it has any kind of a, uh, uh, ha any kind of prognostic impact. Turns out it does. Um, 
So we, in pulmonary hypertension and Hocum patients, um, uh, RV insertion LGE does, does have an effect, uh, um, does, does have an effect on, 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 on clinical outcomes. So uh, that's why we still note it um, in, in our reports when we do it. Okay. Well, what about the future? Um, parametric imaging, so being able to do T1 uh, magnetic characterizations, T2 characterizations, T2 star characterizations are all the rage, uh, not only for the LV, but people are trying it with the RV. And uh, there are 3D uh, parametric mapping techniques out there. Um, so uh, hopefully um, uh, in, in the near future, we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, ironing that out, uh, hopefully having some ex research experience with that and then introducing it into the clinical, um, uh, rel um, clinical reporting as well, clinical use. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all the rage. Um, it's, it's one of the things that uh, covered now, um, so much so there are now uh, parametric mapping uh, working groups uh, in, in existence in, this, in the CMR world. Um, I mentioned that uh, um, the RV is not the most, most clear-cut uh, geometric structure. Uh, 3D CNA techniques are, are on the horizon as well. Um, uh, many physicists and computer scientists are working on how to do accelerated techniques, even free breathing, where you don't have to hold your breath. A lot of the breath hold, uh, uh, maneuvers we do are breath hold, uh, uh, require breath holds to avoid diaphragmatic motion. That's with compressed sensing, uh, post-processing me methods. Uh, uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll get there, and uh, we can just do... Uh, do a push button, acquire the RV, and then get your measurements uh, of the RV based on that. Not only RV, but the LV and everything else as well. Okay. Um, one exciting thing that, uh, sorry for the uh, potato quality image, but a couple, uh, but a couple years ago, uh, I got a, I was excited when uh, one, one CMR uh, researcher uh, a, a clinician presented a virtual CMR oximetry where they were actually able to do a T2 uh, prepped uh, um, uh, Imaging techniques to quantify difference, differences in, in the um, the O2 sat levels of the RV, LV, and different uh, um, uh, uh, blood compartments. So um, people are working on that, and hopefully we can we can do that and, and provide an initial non-invasive oximetry run. So that's on the horizon and very important in congenital patients uh, with their with their RV, PA, and uh, um, RA issues. And of course, um, no talk is complete with. Uh, Without discussing a um, without discussing a 40 flow, this isn't working, which is uh, fine. But uh, uh, I mentioned uh, phase contrast techniques. Uh, um, most of the time, we use conventional 2D phase contrast, but we actually do have the ability to do a 40 flow, so you get uh, three uh, phase contrast in all three dimensions and create uh, um, wonderful streamlines, path lines, and describe uh, not only. Uh, uh, not only uh, velocities, um, um, dominant velocities through the different uh, chambers of the heart, but also discuss uh, um, uh, uh, 3D, 3D flow characteristics like vortices, turbulence, et cetera. But that's on the horizon as well. So much so that uh, uh, one thing that came out of the SCMR um, um, uh, presentation that just, uh, conference that just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, there's actually uh, uh, one scientist working on using 40, uh, 40 flow uh, vortice formation in the pulmonary artery to try to do uh, uh, pulmonary uh, artery pressure, mean, mean PA pressure estimations. So um, this is a very active area um, that's underway. So with that, um, I'd like to summarize and, and uh, uh, since we're a few minutes past the hour, uh, but just to, to resummarize, uh, um, I, hopefully, I gave you a good talk about uh, how CMR um, uh, give, can give uh, different uh, pieces of information about the RV, about its size, its, uh, uh, its, its function. Um, I, uh, hopefully, I convinced you with the data I showed that it has very great reproducibility, reproducibility and repeatability, and hence it's, uh, um, it's a use for establishing, a, uh, establishing a accurate volumes um, and accurate EFs. Um, it can see LGE in the RV, and, and if there's RV infarction present um, or insertion site scar, those are important prognostically. And so we do try to include those findings when we see them in, see them in our lab. And uh, um, there's quite a few new techniques uh, where CMR can uh, um, not only quantify valves, quanti uh, valve function, valve pathology, et cetera, but um, looking at uh, pulmonary pressures, looking at uh, um, um, uh, RV, uh, RV uh, myocardial uh, character characteristics, but those are on the horizon and hopefully uh, coming soon in the uh, in the next next uh, uh, next uh, coming years as well. With that, um, I want to thank everyone for their attention. And uh, um, are there any questions?
Can we assess RV myocardial viability in CMR? If so, are there any part particularities comparing L to LV viability assessment? Um, so for that question, that's an excellent question. I don't think there's anything outside of research, but we all have uh, hy hypothesized that uh, because you can actually image the LV and RV a bit better in, in systole because everything's thickened, that you may be, uh, and actually that's what we kind of do in, in uh, perfusion imaging, that there one could in theory uh, 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 um, uh, do some kind of uh, uh, viability assessment using, using, uh, using perfusion techniques. But uh, there's, uh, it hasn't been uh, uh, accepted uh, widely in clinical use. Um, so so uh, um, nothing uh, that's been widely adopted, I should say, um, mainly limited to research, research purposes at this stage. Second question is, can CMR be more effective than ECHO in the assessment of lead-induced TR? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, with a caveat, because the issue with the uh, patients with, uh, with uh, um, RV leads is they tend to have a, uh, a, big, a big generator. They have a, the can. And so that can create sometimes uh, substantial metallic um, void artifacts that limit our assessment to see the RV completely. So... Provided that's not the issue, we, uh, as I presented before, uh, and, and those metallic artifacts can also affect the PA flow assessment. But provided that's not the, um, the can isn't an issue, the generators don't cause effects, the RV leads themselves don't, don't create a uh, big issue in terms of quantifying the RV stroke volume and uh, quantifying the PA flows. So yes, we can actually assess uh, TR and, and actually uh, uh, see the structures to, to some degree uh, uh, around the tricuspid valve. Um, but yes, it, it can, uh, uh, it, it can uh, uh, provided there's no um, metallic void artifacts from the can, um, uh, provide a very accurate estimation of TR, TR sever severity in, uh, in uh, lead cases. Um, I think those are the only two questions. Anything else? When RV function is depressed, especially due to an akinetic or dyskinetic uh, intraventricular septum, how to tell apart from the LV from RV dysfunction? Um, that's a that that's a good question. That can get challenging um, because uh, we've 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 had uh, case conferences where we got lost trying to figure out where the wall motion was in the RV. Because um, uh, as I mentioned before, the RV motion is not the most straightforward. It's not like this LV where everything comes in cleanly. It actually has a kind of peristaltic motion. There's a differential activation of the myocardium from, from inflow to uh, inflow apex to, to the infundibulum. Um, so, so that can get challenging and we, and, uh, but uh, um, uh, the nice thing about uh, CMR is since we don't have a limited field of view, we are able to get a good um, window, so to speak, um, and see everything. Um, in a dedicated CMR study where we're actually looking for RV motion, um, where we do full full long axis stacks in addition to the short axis stacks, uh, we uh, and and do the full um, uh, RV three chamber and two, uh, all all people get uh, RV three chambers at our institutions. But if we do RV two chambers, then we can reasonably comment on the wall motion in the RV um, and 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 get get a more uh, definitely more reliable uh, uh, assessment of, of wall motion in these patients. Yes. Uh, when there's a bundle branch, then that becomes a little more difficult. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're still able to visualize everything and, and play it, play it over, over time and, and figure it out over the cardiac cycle. Okay. Any other questions or any other thoughts? Okay, it's 10 past the hour. Um, but thank you everyone for attending and thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, um, Hopefully we'll see you all again uh, next week uh, with the next multimodality.